I'm M.G. Lord. This podcast is supported by Amazon Studios, presenting the film Good Night, Oppie, the inspirational true story of the Mars rover opportunity. She went above and beyond her 90-day mission to survive for 15 years. In theaters now and streaming on Prime Video, November 23rd. Every weekday on the Womanica podcast, host Jenny Kaplan tells you about a different woman from history that you may not have heard of, but definitely should know about. Listen to Womanica wherever you get your podcasts. LAS Studios. In the last episode, we focused on the plight of Chen Chushin. In previous episodes, we centered on Frank Molina and Jack Parsons. Well, today, we're going to take a bit of a turn. That's right. It's time for Nazis in Space. I am actually being serious because the involvement of Nazis in the U.S. space program The secret involvement of Nazis, I want to emphasize, and not just a couple, but a ton of them, is one of the darkest, most important chapters of modern rocket science. And it arguably influences the fate of the Suicide Squad as much as the Red Scare or anything else. Let's start here. The V-2 rocket, the world's first long-range guided ballistic missile developed in Nazi Germany. It was called the V-2 missile, and it was one of their, quote, vengeance weapons. Yes, V for vengeance. The V-2 is almost 50 feet tall, weighs about 14 tons, and was the first rocket to reach space. But unlike Molina's rocket, which was more than twice as small as the V-2, it was designed to attack allies' cities, terrorize populations, and ultimately kill thousands. In the eyes of the U.S. military, the V-2 had the potential to change the course of the war. So the U.S. military uh, invited uh, von Kármán to study the German efforts through the intelligence uh, information, but then eventually for von Kármán to lead a group of scientists to go to Germany. That's Zhou Yu Wang. We heard from him in the last episode. He's a professor of history at California State Polytechnic University at Pomona. And just to pause for a second, remember that during World War II, the Suicide Squad, through Galsit, then through JPL, was helping the war effort, both with the JADOs, the Jet Assisted Takeoff Engines, and later with missiles for field use. Well, as Zhou Yu said, During the war, von Karman was studying the V-2 and other German weapons through secret intelligence. And at the end of the war, Theodore von Karman flew to Europe, along with Chen Shushen and a few others, to get a closer look. Basically, the Army wanted a team of top scientists to interrogate German scientists and inspect their R&D facilities to go see what the Nazi rocketeers had been up to this whole time. Here's Eric Conway, resident historian of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The U.S. sent a large delegation of scientists and engineers into to Nazi Germany um, late in the war to look at the scientific infrastructure that had been built during the 30s, really, and 40s. And fun fact, the guys he's describing, they're traveling under the code name, quote, Operation Lusty. Von Karman called the name, quote, unlikely but pleasant. Anyway, the war is wrapping up, and Von Karman and his team are constantly on the move, hopping in and out of jeeps, going from one city to another. The infrastructure Eric's referring to here means stuff like laboratories and research facilities that had been captured by the Allies, where the Germans had made advances in rocketry and engineering in the previous years. But what von Karman and Chen find out is that a lot of that progress was also made at concentration camps. 
It relied on slave labor, enslaved people working under extremely depraved conditions, frequently dying just to get those rockets built. They saw some of the concentration camps. They saw the Mittelwerk where the V2s were built in underground slave labor. They knew firsthand what had, what had been done. Chen, in particular, was disgusted. Here's Zoyu. He was repelled by what he saw uh, in Germany in, under the Nazi military projects, how people were treated, especially how the Jewish laborers were treated. In Iris Chan's uh, biography of H.S. Chan, as titled uh, Thread of the Silkworm, she quotes the Chan for having apparently said something to the effect that uh, I will learn from the Germans, but I will not eat with them when he refused apparently to have uh, meals with some of the German scientists. Well, unfortunately, Chen's attitude wasn't the prevailing attitude. Instead, a lot of those scientists, over a thousand in fact, would be quietly invited to cross the Atlantic. It was a decades-long secret project to bring these guys to the United States, set them up with comfortable careers without any mention of their Nazi past, all in exchange for lending brain power to Uncle Sam's R&D. It would come to be known as Operation Paperclip. In my opinion, it's one of the U.S. government's biggest deals with the devil, and God knows we've had some whoppers. A deal in which, as they say about warfare, to the victor go the spoils. But it's also a deal where, while the U.S. works with Hitler's scientists, it decides to get rid of its own homegrown geniuses, guys like Molina and Chen. I'll be honest, I'm not sure which side of the deal annoys me more. I'm M.G. Lord, and this is Blood, Sweat, and Rockets. I'm M.G. Lord. This podcast is supported by Amazon Studios, presenting the film Goodnight Oppie, the inspirational true story of the Mars rover opportunity. She went above and beyond her original 90-day mission to survive for 15 years. Goodnight Oppie charts Opportunity's unforgettable journey as she searched for life on Mars and the remarkable bond forged between a robot and her humans millions of miles away. Goodnight Oppie is the feel-good movie for the entire family, in theaters now and streaming on Prime Video. Of course, the famous person uh, who was most at the center of V2 development was Dr. Vanner von Braun, who was a rocket engineer and physicist. This is Michael Neufeld, senior curator at the Department of Space History, National Air and Space Museum, Smithsonian Institution. He was, of course, later famous for coming to the United States, working for the Army, then for NASA, and being the leader of the Huntsville Center for NASA that designed the Saturn V that sent astronauts to the moon. So he became an extremely famous American, which is an interesting later career for someone who had been so prominent in Nazi Germany. We'll talk about von Braun a lot more later in this episode. For now, all you need to know is that he was a prominent European rocket scientist who led Germany's rocket development program before and during the war. As a result of a major British air raid in August 1943, production of the V-2 rocket was evacuated to a series of tunnels underground in north central Germany. Uh, that was called the Mittelwerk, the Central Works and uh, concentration camp workers were used under terrible conditions to help build the rockets. And von Braun was certainly knowledgeable about that. There wasn't much he could do about it, but he was certainly knowledgeable about it. He saw the conditions. And part of be having a career in Nazi Germany, he was both a member of the Nazi party and an officer in the SS. So, not just a Nazi, but an SS officer building rockets with slave labor at a concentration camp, who later becomes a director at NASA. Let's take it slowly. So, back to Germany, 
In the final days of the war, von Karman and his band of scientists are inspecting captured facilities, interrogating German scientists. In the spring of 1945, they meet von Braun. It's Chen who interviews him. Now, we don't have a record of their conversation, but it did yield a six-page paper that von Braun wrote called Quote, survey of development of liquid rockets in Germany and their future prospects. It actually makes for some pretty interesting reading. You can find it on the web. Von Braun talks about not just what Germany achieved, but what they'd hoped to achieve. Things like rockets traveling between the U.S. and Europe. Things like a giant mirror hanging in space, capable of generating, quote, deadly degrees of heat at certain spots of the Earth's surface, close quote. You know, in case Germany had won and Hitler wanted to burn down some random city somewhere. Then the American scientists visit the Middle Baudora concentration camp, where slave laborers were constructing the V-2s. According to Iris Chang's book, a Nazi war criminal once called Dora, quote, the hell of all concentration camps, unquote. Here are a couple things that were commonplace there. Torture, severe beatings, executions, and public hangings. Basically, thousands upon thousands of people, Jewish people, but also many Roma, lots of people from across Europe, died while constructing the rockets. In his autobiography, von Karman describes some of the German scientists he interviewed. There's a small group who followed orders because they didn't see any alternative. Another group who argued that they were just working for the good of science. And others who embraced Hitler's agenda. Remember, von Karman is a Hungarian emigre, so some of these guys were his old buddies. Here's Eric Conway again. I mean, von Karman is not shy about pointing out how horrified he was that his people, you know, people he'd worked with, had not just done what the Third Reich had, had, had demanded of them, and, you know, you they shot people for not doing what, what they wanted, but they were enthusiastic about it. That's what really horrified him. I want to clarify something in case it's confusing to have two Vons in this story. Theodor von Karman, the Suicide Squad patron and benefactor who we've heard about in previous episodes, not a Nazi. Far from it, in fact. Werner von Braun the rocketeer, widely credited with the success of the U.S. space program. He was a Nazi. Think von Braun. Brown shirt. Von Braun's comments over the years regarding his Nazism, his denials on whether or not he witnessed deaths or beatings, have been challenged, found to be inconsistent, and often reek of frightened claptrap. For example, according to Annie Jacobson's 2014 book, Operation Paperclip, in 1944, von Braun took it upon himself to write a letter to try to procure some more enslaved workers from Buchenwald, another concentration camp. Here, he's writing to an engineer, quote, During my last visit to the Mittelwerk, you propose to me that we use the good technical education of detainees available to you from Buchenwald. I immediately looked into your proposal by going to Buchenwald myself, together with Dr. Simon, a colleague, to seek out more qualified detainees. I have arranged their transfer to the Mittelwerk, close quote. Kind of hard to believe he's so ignorant of the treatment of his slave laborers when he's touring other concentration camps to find new ones. In any case, in 1945, with the end of the war in sight, von Braun and his colleagues decided to surrender to American troops. This is essentially when Paperclip begins, at least the seeds of it. Think of it like this. After a war, battlefields were littered with all kinds of valuable things that the victors take home with them. Like I said, spoils of war. Well, the U.S. government realized they now had a bunch of intelligent scientists on their hands. What were they going to do? Let the Russians have them? Here's Eric. 
the U.S. believed that the Nazis had been ahead of the United States in a number of technological areas. And so what they did was they basically smuggled those people into the country secretly. He means they smuggled the Nazis into the United States. And set them up in various research institutes. A large group of them were von Braun's rocketeers. The total number of German engineers, academics, and technicians will end up being more than 1,500 people, including men who were war criminals and security threats. You know, not the types the State Department is inclined to grant visas to normally. Because, let's point out, the United States government wasn't in the habit of hiring Nazis. This was a really big deal. Multiple men in the group had worked side by side with Adolf Hitler, Heinrich Himmler, Hermann Goering. So the question is, why did a group of people embedded deeply in the U.S. government want to work with these guys so badly? I'm M.G. Lord. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. The rocket scientists at JPL could tell you that even when there's a user manual, things don't always go according to plan. But life doesn't come with a user manual. Before I worked with a therapist, I used to think, why do I need one? I can talk out my problem with my friends. But I'm glad I changed course, because in therapy, I discovered my problem was my friend's. Sometimes life can be a lot, but therapy can help. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com Rockets. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Rockets. Okay, let's get into it. Operation Paperclip, also known as Project Paperclip. Here's Michael Neufeld again. So after World War II, Nazi Germany is defeated. All the four major powers grab this technology and all begin developing rockets and missiles of their own. And notably, both uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, and to a lesser extent, France, took Germans and they started building more sophisticated weapons. Technology, meaning the guts of the German war machine, artillery, missiles, planes, and ships. Not to mention the Germans who had the know-how to make it all happen. Basically, the Allies are grabbing up all the stuff the Nazis developed that the Allies didn't have. Because remember, we're entering the beginning of the Cold War. All these countries are about to enter an arms race. Warfare has been incredibly modernized during the past two decades. And now you can combine a missile with a nuclear warhead. It's called an Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM. In short, there is a global arms race, and that massively accelerates the development of ballistic missiles, such that by the end of the 1950s, the Soviet Union and the United States are both on the verge of deploying ICBMs that could hit each other's country with nuclear warheads in half an hour. Partly, Michael says, this arms race is all to do with World War II's singularity. It's great leaps in weaponry. Like we've pointed out, the winner's spoils include your enemy's technical prowess. So at the end of the war, you've got Britain, France, and the United States arriving from the West, scouring Germany for things to scoop up. Documents, weapons, scientists, etc. And then you've got the Russians approaching from the East, doing exactly the same thing. Michael says the different powers were quite specific in what they were searching for. The United States put the emphasis on picking out the best people and scooping up the leaders of various groups and bringing them to the U.S. And notably, they picked up Vanna von Braun and brought him and 120 or so other Germans from the V-2 rocket project over. 
The Soviets often scarfed up whole factory groups and deported them. So the Soviets took thousands of people, actually, uh, most of them in, in aviation, uh, and ultimately they shipped them off to the Soviet Union at the end of 1946. Now, initially, the Americans' plan was to exploit their new engineers for all they're worth, then ship them back to Europe. But very rapidly, as the Cold War grew, we decided to keep them and to immigrate them. So the United States brought the Germans in and integrated them as immigrants into the American society. The Soviets had a slightly different approach. Stick their captives in isolated colonies, pump them for information, maybe get them to contribute for a while to a missile or aircraft project, but then ship them back. Not so for the United States. Not so for JPL, for that matter. I think that's what I wanted to talk to Michael about the most. After the worst war the world has ever seen, tens of millions dead, how does a jet propulsion laboratory and other groups, including the United States government, justify hiring a bunch of guys with innocent blood on their hands, so to speak? It changed over time from this, bring them over for six months, bring them over for 12 months, get the knowledge from them and then send them back into, we must keep them a, because they uh, would help our people develop missiles, aircraft, whatever. And also because we wanted to keep them out of uh, Soviet hands and the potential of going over to the Soviet Union and working for the other side. So as the Cold War got worse, you know, Paperclip evolved into a project of long-term and permanent immigration of people into the United States. That created a problem because a lot of them had Nazi records and party records or in some cases SS like von Braun, you know, and that made them potentially in conflict with the rules that have been set down that said we wouldn't take ardent Nazis. No, according to Michael, what the military did instead was cover up. They said any Nazis they'd brought over hadn't been true believers. They'd only joined Hitler to protect their careers. Meanwhile, they're justifying it to themselves by saying, hey, at least we got them before the Russians did. It got easier and easier to say, we need these people and we need to keep them out of Soviet hands. Their records were classified and not known to the public. And the public was given a, a whitewash story that we nobody had was a was an ardent Nazi and we didn't really have any real problems with them and they're all contributing to American military technology. Always people ask, we brought von Braun over to help us with our space program. Point I always make is we didn't have a space program in 1945. Paperclip and the von Braun group came to help us with missile projects, missile development. It was all about the military and developing military capability for the United States, and space was not on our agenda at all. We should point out again, it wasn't just von Braun and the V-2 team. By the 1950s, Werner and his rocketeers constituted a couple hundred people, which is believed to be less than 20% of all of Paperclip. Hundreds of men who'd become academics, engineers, employees at private corporations, including the aerospace industry here in Southern California. I mean, most likely one of my father's colleagues at JPL or another aerospace company was a former Nazi. Who knows? Here's Michael again. A lot of investigative journalists cast this whole program as this conspiracy to smuggle Nazis in the United States to help the military, regardless of President Truman's order. There's just no evidence that this was a conspiracy. Truman was knowledgeable about the program and, you know, as the Cold War grew, was knowledgeable about the fact that we were trying to use some people who might have had records who were a little dubious by our original standards. The two extremes on Paperclip are is this devious conspiracy to bring Nazis into the United States, or on the other extreme, it was this wonderful program to build these, bring these German scientists engineers and help our country. And I think the reality is that, you know, it's somewhere in between those.
Michael made the point that not all the people brought over were dyed in the wool Nazis. Yes, some were true believers, significantly compromised, but many were simply opportunistic, mid-level. Even a few were anti-Nazis. So, von Braun goes on to become chief architect of the Apollo Saturn V rocket. He gets us to the moon. He's called the father of rocket science. He even gets featured on an episode of Walt Disney's show, Disneyland. If we were to start today on an organized and well-supported space program, I believe a practical passenger rocket could be built and tested within 10 years. In fact, his Nazi past doesn't become widely known until after his death in 1977. Instead, in the 50s and 60s, he becomes one of the most well-known faces of the American space program, and definitely more famous, more renowned than Frank Molina or any of the other JPL pioneers. Here's a fun moment. In 1962, when von Braun is director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, he's asked about the possibility of women flying in space. Well, he says, he's all for it. In fact, they're, quote, reserving 110 pounds of payload for recreational equipment, close quote. You can always count on an SS officer for a classy press conference. Anyway, a sticking point for me is that Fun Brown and his buddies gradually accumulate the lion's share of the credit for 20th century American success in rocketry, while JPL founders Molina and Chen are wiped off the map. Here's Zhou Yu Wang. We heard from him at the top of the episode. It was widely perceived that uh, the U.S. lagged far behind the Germany in aerospace. That's why those German scientists were brought over to the U.S. And also later on, when the U.S. achieved the success in aerospace, uh, much of the credit went to those German scientists, engineers like uh, uh, Werner von Braun. I think it was uh, widely underestimate how much progress the U.S. had made under the leadership of von Kármán and Molina, and also the effort that Chen personally participated in at the JPL. So I can imagine how Chen may have been critical of having seen how uh, all the credit uh, was given to the German uh, immigrant uh, scientists, engineers. Uh, he probably have, would have felt that uh, JPL deserved more credit for the success of the U.S. space program. Later in his life, Molina himself worried he was being written out of aerospace's history books. In 1975, he wrote a letter to JPL's director, quote, I realize that history is frequently revised to meet pressures of the moment. In the field of politics, the practice is rather general. But I do believe that in the domains of science and technology, such revision should be resisted. To see the V2 and its engineers brought into the heart of the US space establishment, while at the same time, people who worked at JPL being hounded or harassed or marginalized or neglected or exiled. It was a hard thing for Melina particularly to stomach. That's Fraser McDonnell, whom we've heard a lot from in previous episodes. He's a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and author of Escape from Earth, A Secret History of the Space Rocket. He has a wonderful way of summing the whole thing up. There's a great paradox that the US essentially exiled their own homegrown rocket program, started by leftist graduate students at Caltech, and marginalized that precisely because of their political baggage, but were at the same time completely at ease with the political baggage of another group of rocketeers who are members of the Nazi party, who never seriously sought to make clear or in any way repent of their willingness to work for the Nazi war machine. Like, that is really quite extraordinary. So the question is, why do more Americans to this day celebrate von Braun's V2 for its role in helping get us to the moon, but not the Suicide Squad's whack corporal? 
why was homegrown American rocket development so often minimized next to the work of our German imports, some of whom were Nazis, SS officers? The answer is, I have no idea, unless it's just our great American trait of doing whatever is most convenient at the moment, Nazis or not. Unfortunately, Von Braun wasn't the only one who eclipsed Melina and Chen in the popular imagination. In fact, there's one Suicide Squad member who was barred from working in rocketry, yet somehow became a bigger name than the rest. There have been books, songs, even a TV series dedicated to him. But maybe it's not about his contributions to rocketry. Maybe it's because his mysterious death remains unsolved to this day. Next time on Blood, Sweat, and Rockets, the explosive demise of Jack Parsons. L.A. Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets is hosted by me, M.G. Lord. The show is a production of L.A. Studios in collaboration with Western Sound. Shana Naomi Crockmall is our vice president of podcasts, and Antonia Sarahito is the executive producer for Alea Studios. Ben Adair is the executive producer for Western Sound. Dan Leone is the showrunner. Producers are Savannah Wright, Tyler Hill, Caitlin Parker, and Becky Nicolaitis. The show is written by Rachel Knowles, Rose Kranz Baldwin, and me, M.G. Lord. It was edited by Savannah Wright. Sound design by Tyler Hill. Mixing and mastering by Tom McLean. Research and consulting by History Studio. Our website at alaus.com is designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital marketing teams at Alaus Studios. The marketing team of Alaus Studios created our branding. Thanks to the team at Alea Studios, including Taylor Kaufman, Sabir Brara, Kristen Hayford, Kristen Muller, Andy Orozco, Michael Cosentino, and Leo G. L.A. Made, Blood, Sweat, and Rockets is a production of Alea Studios. Support for this podcast is made possible by Gordon and Donna Crawford, who believe that quality journalism makes Los Angeles a better place to live. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. At Womanica, every month is Women's History Month. This month, they're highlighting rebels, women who broke rules that were meant to be broken. Learn about incredible women across world history, from pirates to philosophers and everything in between. And if you didn't catch last month's episodes on iconic mothers from history like Burtis Baldwin and Clara Hale, now is the perfect time to binge. Tune in to Womanica every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts.